I'm Professor Peter Jonasson, your stylish scientist, and I am back again, as I promised. But we're going to take a departure from our typical conversations about mating to go into the other side of really why I started this YouTube channel about fashion. And it's very hard to get started on how to talk about this, given it's, given it's not my profession, but it's been something that's been my entire life. So I've always been uh, interested in clothes and dressing well. There was even a time I thought I wanted to be a fashion designer when I was a teenager. And I've had to kind of thread the needle between these two things in my life, right? being a scientist and being interested in fashion. And it's, uh, as the title of this YouTube video suggests, um, what I want to talk about today is how to study fashion like a scientist. But there's another way we could put this maybe a more provocative way, in a way that probably wouldn't get as many uh, 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 hits on YouTube, which would be fashion for fucking nerds, right? Like something that nerds and, and intellectual people are not particularly well known for or interested in. How might you study scientifically, not just in terms of people's preferences, like their opinions, but how about you scientifically go about starting to study something as, uh, as amorphous, as chaotic, as individualistic, um, as fashion, right? We, we make our clothes are different, our bodies are different, the colors are different, the textures are different. How do you take all this noise and create some system, some way to approach studying fashion, studying style, studying elegance, in a way that doesn't just feel like somebody's opinion. Indeed, most fashion advice is really just that, right? These people aren't doing scientific studies. And so when they say to you something like, you know, wearing pants that don't have a break in them as they go down will make you look taller, for example. Now, it makes sense, but very rarely are there good systematic studies uh, uh, done. Now, of course, some have been done, and that is always the case. I always tell my students, you never say it's never done because there could be some paper from some undergraduate student in Hungary from 20 years ago that you just never found, right? But it's, it's not something that academics study systematically a lot in a lot of ways because academics are not really all that fashionable as people. Like, they, they, they don't, they eschew the aesthetic. They, they object to the aesthetic. They think it's beneath them in some ways, right? But my whole life has been style and science, right? That's me. And so I want to start moving towards a space, both with you and in my career, that we can start studying uh, fashion. Partly because it gets boring to study the same things all the time. And so I've been studying the dark triad since 2007. I've been studying mate choice since earlier than that. So I want to study something different, and we're going to try to lay out a foundation for us here. And the first thing we got to start with is dealing with the chaos. Well, as a scientist, as a quantitative thinker, um, I have to concede that really we have to take this, for some people, rather uh, troubling philosophical position. Uh, it's not troubling for me, but a lot of people object to this idea, but it's called reductionism. And just like it sounds, we're trying to reduce and carve up the world into smaller units. Indeed, what I would contend for you now is that being fashionable, being stylish, being elegant is really just composed of smaller parts. Now, what those parts are, scientists have to figure out. And you can do this by either uh, taking an inductive approach right from the ground up, or you can do a deductive approach. And what I'm kind of going to describe for you here is my musings in a, in a kind of deductive method about what are the primary dimensions that we might at least start, maybe not the exhaustive dimensions, but that we might start in studying the psychology of, of fashion, of elegance, of that type of thing, right? But the problem is you have two different schools of approach here, and I see this as an evolutionary psychologist where, you, where I'm in the middle of these two fields, right? You have biology and you have psychology. And the way biologists study things like, let's just say beauty, the aesthetic, you know, how they study a beautiful bird, right? What are the features of a bird, right? And that's just it. It's the features. So the biology approach is very physical in nature, right? It's countable. It's physically measurable. Like it's the, the iridic iridicity, whatever the word is. How do you say it? Uh, of, of this, um, 
you know, scales on some fish, it's the, the, the length of the tail of some bird, right? Um, and it might also be part of what's called the larger idea of an extended phenotype, right? That your, not just your plumage, but your clothes might actually be part of your extended phenotype as you use those things to advertise things about you, right? It's the external manifestation of your internal system. It could be the manifestation of your not caring as well, but I think people actually would care if they understood the psychology of fashion and how it affects other people, how it affects you, uh, and that's what we hope to, to move forward with in this uh, um, conversation here. So let's, let's move over from this bio part to the psychology part. And so in, with the, the psychology side of studying elegance, fashion, right, these, these little pieces that would accumulate to you saying this is a stylish person, an elegant person, comes down to things that are perceptual in nature, attitudinal in nature, motivational in nature. They're even social in nature, right? Like social rules, norms, context, things like that, right? So this is where I think as an evolutionary psychologist, I can provide potentially more interesting insight because I'm, I'm on both sides of this equation. I say, okay, well, you know, uh, how can we jive what we know about uh, studying the beauty in the world and the natural world? to studying the beauty in the nightclub, in the classroom, in the workplace, on a date, right? So let's go quickly, as, and as quick as I can, because I, I hate doing long videos, and thank you for those of you who watched my long videos and me blah blah blahing, um, but let's talk about biomarkers, and those biomarkers are going to be those physical things, and I'm going to try to go through a little bit of all of these little markers that I'm going to uh, tell you about. So the first one would be fit. Now the thing about fit is, it's not about how something fits on some model. It's how it fits on you. And so it really behooves you to get tailoring, right? So maybe when you're just getting into suits, I mean, and I'm going to use male fashion more than female fashion because for obvious reasons, right? Uh, maybe you start with off the rack. And then you move on to getting things tailored. And then you move on to made to measure. And then you move on to bespoke. Uh, I haven't gotten to that last one yet. For my own style, I'm, 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 a, I'm refusing to go that way but because uh, I know it's going to be a rabbit hole where I'm just, I can't get out of. Uh, but it suggests that there are, um, that you, you need to personalize your fashion. Right? But also there's some, maybe three main fits out there, right? There's the American fit, which tends to be quite boxy. Americans are terrible, known around the world for being statistically terrible at dressing. Then you have the Italian fit, which is, part of the, uh, an expression of the Italian climate, for example, right? And the Italian thinness as well. So it's much more th um, tightly cut suits, uh, as well as fabrics that breathe a little bit better, right? And then we have, of course, the British style, which, no surprise, it's based on, well, it's cold. And so tweeds, for example, like uh, the suit I was wearing a few days ago, which was a tweed suit. I love it, but it's for colder weather. And now that it's getting warm here in uh, Warsaw, I probably won't get to wear it as much as I would in the winter or the fall. To move on to the next one, we have color. Now, there's many, many colors and all kinds of ways of matching, and the issue of matching has a lot to do with perceptual uh, biases and how colors go together, but when it comes to the physical features of matching and color, you kind of want to stick to one, two, th or three colors, and not extending beyond it. Now, Three colors is pretty advanced fashion, being able to match up three different colors, for example. Right? Uh, for example, if I wore a, a brown blazer with this outfit here, that would be advanced fashion, because now I'd have a third level. Right? I'd have cream, blue, and brown. Now, I'm going only at level two today, which is blue, blue, and cream. The middle level of fashion is the most common level, this number two. Uh, uh, for, uh, let's say, stylish lifestyle, right? Like, it's very complicated to match three colors sometimes. And the mo most basic, and I mean that in all the ways of the world, word basic, are the monochromatic looks. And this is not just the standard uh, young person wardrobe of wearing all black. It's also the tonal kind of matching, where, like, if I wore a cream shirt to go with this, these cream pants, for example. And this is a good way to start, right? So you start with this kind of black, gray, white, and then you move on from there doing this kind of tonal. So it's like uh, colors one, colors 1.5, and then you get to colors two. Right? 
Two, as I said, is the most common. So people throw a pair of jeans together and a shirt, and they they have two colors. Yeah. Okay. To the next uh, biomarker, proportions. Proportions are about um, how things fit relative to, for example, the the you know the golden ratio, right? So high waisted pants give men the, and women as well give this golden ratio, and so you could measure the actual you know proportions of top body to lower body, for example, as a way of um, analyzing these dimensions. And then these dimensions, uh, if you have multiple markers, you could do what are called factor analysis, which I won't bother you with, in particular principal components analysis. And it could, in theory, help you carve up mathematically what are those dimensions in biology. They do, they do this for the face, for example. Some amazing work that I'm, it's beyond me by colleagues of mine like uh, like Ian and Danielle um, in, in the UK and in Australia, respectively, uh, they, Ian Stevens and, and, and Daniel um, Sulikovsky, uh, they use this kind of principal components to work out what are the main features of the face. And you could do this just as well with fashion once you have a series of markers to put in. Um, and these proportions can be uh, shoulder width, they can be uh, breast size, a a really anything you want to put in there, right? Um, last of the biomarkers would be texture. So texture like the like you see in the animal king would be something like that, right? So some textures interact with light differently than others. Some textures have a tactile sensation to them where they, they feel differently on your body and they, they when other people touch you, they might feel differently. Okay, so those are the, let's say, the my initial biomarkers that I'll offer you. Now let's go to the psychology marker. The psychology markers, I'll start with the first one we could call, is about a matter of the occasion, right? And this is another way of saying context. So is it a job interview? Is it a date, right? And these, these contexts can be real or imagined, right? So um, you don't have to literally be going on a date, but if you want to present that appearance of being a successful man or a successful woman, for whatever reason, you might dress in a particular way. This gets us to this uh, quantifiable thing, let's call it a quasi-quantifiable thing, of what I call the formality scale. And I've seen it in many places on the internet, you know, this kind of stuff, right? Where you have something very casual at one end and it moves up. Now, is dressing linear like this? Is formality linear? Well, probably not. It's probably multidimensional. But you have to start somewhere. Right? And so you should always start with a unidimensional conceptualization unless you have good reason to start with a multidimensional one. I, I, I suspect part of the chaos of fashion is that it's not only you know, multidimensional, it's, it's so multidimensional, it's, it's overwhelming for people to put their, their, their brains to. Okay? So the next psychology, psychology marker would be something like norms. Right? And so there are normative pressures, social pressures that say you should dress this way or that way. Right? So your age will dictate some of those things. Your profession will dictate some of those things. The clubs that you find yourself a part of, maybe you have a club jacket or you have club colors. And I mean clubs, clubs could even be gangs. It doesn't have to be clubs. It could also be violent things, right? Leather jackets, certain colors of your handkerchief, etc., etc. Right. So these are all part of the chaos of fashion that we have to deal with to try to reduce it to say, how can we start studying fashion scientifically as opposed to people's just musings about their personal opinion over 20 years of working in fashion, for example. Uh, uh, the next mm, psychology marker, I guess, is like, it would be impression management. There's a huge function that fashion and style can serve to signal to other people who you are. And so you could choose to present different kinds of images. The one image that I like to present, and maybe I present too much, is the image of competence. And so I try to signal intentionally competence, sophistication, elegance. I intentionally signal that, right? And other people see me as such. But what that might mean is I lose out on another thing that people like to signal and, li and like in people, which is approachability. Some clothes will push people away some, pe some clothes will draw people in, right? A person who's wearing more casual clothes will seem more relatable, easier to talk to. You see this in U.S. presidents in their, when they're trying to get elected. Maybe they don't wear their tie. Maybe they unbutton their shirt. Maybe they take off their jacket, right? They're trying to seem like more of a man of the people, if you will, 
right? There's a great saying to go with this, right? It's, it's dress for the job you want. Now, if you remove the word job, you can replace anything you want. Dress for the relationship you want. Dress for uh, uh, the promotion you want. Whatever it is, you can use this, your clothes as a way of signaling this extended phenotype. This, I want to tell, tell the world about me. This is the story I'm telling, right? I'm telling that I'm a competent, elegant man. That's the story I'm telling, right? And then I walk with Pedro without a leash and all that, and I'm signaling maybe I'm nurturing or whatever in terms of mating, and, but in also in terms of how people around me see me, right? They see me as this guy, right? And maybe that makes me unapproachable. Maybe it doesn't. I don't know. I think it doesn't, though. I think it, I think it does make me unapproachable for some people, people who are not really comfortable. But I digress. The last psychology marker would be something like personality or character, right? So what it signals, for example, is attention to detail. When you start getting into fashion, you, there's all these little things that you, you start learning about and all these small things that um, you, you, you start small and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and it's, it overtakes your wardrobe, right? But it says, this person cares about the little things, right? Does, does enough of my shirt peek out of my, of my blazer sleeve, for example? Do I have uh, buttons on my uh, blazer sleeve that are what are called surgeon's cuff, where they actually open as opposed to they're just decorative cuffs, yeah? for example? One particular feature is the last thing we'll talk about today is the issue of distinctiveness. I like dressing distinctive. There's no question. But as a sex difference, women tend to dress more for distinctiveness and men tend to dress more for fitting in. Think about uniforms. Men are more well associated with uniforms. Even the way men dress at a nightclub, they look more similar than they look different. Indeed, one of the old pickup artist advice was to dress distinctively. It, 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 this is attention-seeking behavior, right? So in this way, women are going out in these amazing shoes and amazing dresses, and it's ultimately uh, attention-seeking, even if they're not aware of it. And I, I won't go into here why, in this way, women are more attention-seeking than men are typically attention-seeking. Uh, but distinctiveness is uh, something that kind of hedges on the biopsychology uh, space, right? So there's psychological aspects of it, like, for example, narcissism, but there's also biological aspects of it, what are called costly signaling theory, which is if you stand out, you're more likely to get eaten, for example, right? So the, the idea and, and the beauty of the peacock's tail is that it's a Zahavian handicap, it's called, right? So having this amazing thing that makes you very distinctive also makes you more likely to be predated upon by uh, 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 tigers, for example. Now, of course, I'm not immune to the, or blind or deaf to the argument that peacocks are the males, and so in the animal kingdom, the males seem to be the one doing all the distinctiveness, right? The males are doing this signaling uh, 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 behavior, and, and that's part of why it's sexy, is because they're taking that risk, right? That costly signaling, all right? So, that's my start. Leave me some comments. Maybe there's other ideas in this space you want to talk about. Maybe things you want to want me to talk about in another video. And maybe um, I can do uh, uh, more detail about any of these topics we've, we've had here. All right? So that's it from your stylist scientist. Please uh, like, share, uh, comment, subscribe, all that wonderful stuff. All right? Have a good day, everybody. Ciao.